Welcome everyone to Smart Contracts and Decentralized Finance. This is a master level class here at the University of Basel in part two of our new Open Crypto Lecture series. In this class, you'll learn how to read and write smart contracts. You will even get a chance to create your own smart contract based protocols and you will look into a new exciting ecosystem referred to as decentralized finance. What's special about this class is that we will always have two perspectives. Of course, you will get the technical background. In order to create these protocols, you will learn the programming languages necessary, but you will also get the economic intuition behind it. And from a finance perspective, we will of course also look into these protocols. So it's the mixture, this interdisciplinary mixture that is needed to understand this space. Let's get started. The course consists of seven sections. In section one, I will give you a quick overview of the blockchain fundamentals. Now, some of this is repetition in case you have taken the Bitcoin blockchain and crypto assets course, but it's always a good idea to bring everyone up to speed and build basically a common foundation where we can build on. Section two turns to Ethereum. Here we look really into the specifics of this protocol and the specifics of the Ethereum smart contracts platform. That's something you need to understand before we actually go into the programming part, which starts with section three. Uh, this section, of course, is somewhat hands-on. Uh, we will make the introduction to Solidity, the programming language for smart contracts that is mainly used on Ethereum, but you will also get a chance to actually create your own smart contracts and to do something with it. Uh, you don't learn how to program uh, just by listening to lectures. You have to actually apply it, and that's exactly the idea of this section. In section four, we turn to DeFi or decentralized finance. Uh, I will first give you an overview over this ecosystem and show you what it's all about. And then we will go through the DeFi stack, starting with the asset layer. And with the asset layer, of course, we're talking about assets and assets on the blockchain are usually referred to as tokens. So unsurprisingly, in this section, we will look into the tokenization standards and the economic intuition of the tokenization of various asset classes. In section six, we will look into DeFi protocols. With DeFi protocols, it can be pretty much anything from decentralized exchanges to decentralized lending pools. So basically, whenever you create or recreate a service in a decentralized way with these smart contracts as a, an independent protocol on the public blockchain, then we are talking about these DeFi protocols that are part of the DeFi protocol layer. That's exactly what we will look into in this section. And then finally, section seven is the discussion uh, where we will go over some of the advanced topics. And also, of course, I will give you an outlook into some uh, potential future topics. Now let's get started by looking into what a smart contract actually is and why we should talk about it. The term smart contract is somewhat unfortunate because these things unfortunately are neither smart nor are they really contracts as any person with a legal background will tell you. But the term goes back to the original paper where these things have been proposed and the original paper is by Nick Sabo and he used the term smart contract to describe what he actually wanted to achieve. Now in this paper, he uses the example of a vending machine and I think that's actually a great analogy for a predecessor of a smart contract. When you think of a vending machine, what it actually is, it's a, some form of a codified uh, machine that makes a breach of contract really expensive, right? You have these instructions, you have this agreement, and it's really written, uh, it's really stored on the vending machine itself. So when something happens, in this case, whenever I'm inserting a coin, then I get an output, I get a result, in this case, I receive, let's say, a, a soft drink, okay? So we will start really slowly with pseudocode. Of course, later on, we will use actual code, but just for this example, for the sake of this example, uh, bear with me. Simplest pseudocode example of a vending machine is if coin is larger or equal price, then dispense, dispense beverage, dispense the soft drink, okay? Right here. And the second function that we'll get call this return change and return change with the argument coin minus price. So that's basically uh, the change you get back in case you you, uh, you um, paid more than the price of the beverage actually is. Else, 
print a message on the vending machine that says insufficient funds. You haven't put enough funds in there, so insufficient funds, you don't get your beverage, okay? And that's a super simple pseudocode example of a vending machine that codifies this agreement, that makes breach of contract hard. Um, it just makes it harder. I mean, you can still cheat. The, for example, the, all, uh, all of these uh, well-known techniques, and of course, I'm not saying do that, but I think everybody knows about it, like shaking the vending machine or trying um, to grab some of the beverages, uh, reach in there. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it's not recommended and it's highly illegal, but you, you, hypothetically speaking, you could still do that, right? I mean, there is still the option of cheating. It's not a, a completely bulletproof way of ensuring that this agreement will be enforced. Now, there are actually two more issues with this vending machine. When you think about it, with a vending machine like that, you have to trust the person who has set up the vending machine, and for two reasons, actually. Reason number one, it's completely closed source. You don't know what code is on there. The code is not observable. You're just going to assume that this code is on there right here. You're just going to assume that whenever you insert the coin, you will actually get your prep beverage, but you don't know. It could be something completely different on there, and there is no way for you to actually observe what code is on the vending machine. And number two, even if there is the correct code on the vending machine, you are not in control of the execution environment someone else's, namely the vendor. So for example, there could be something manipulated hardware-wise that even though the correct code gets executed, you will not receive your beverage, right? So there are really these two dependencies where you have to rely on the vendor. And of course, and generally when we talk about smart contracts, we're talking about processes, uh, mainly in financial applications, but it could also be something else. So we're not necessarily talking about an actual vending machine, but this really nicely demonstrates what's so special about smart contracts, because smart contracts solve exactly these two issues. With smart contracts, you can look into the code. So the code, the contract uh, code is observable. You know exactly what is supposed to happen before you actually interact with the smart contract. Why? Because it's on the public blockchain and it's observable by everyone. And number two, the execution environment, um, the Ethereum virtual machine in our case, is not under the exclusive control of just one person. It's also part of this public blockchain network. So everyone is involved in the execution and everyone can verify the correct execution um, as it is part of the consensus protocol. And this is the big difference. Now, unfortunately, in many cases, people say smart contracts are about automation. So that you can make things more efficient. You can automate things with smart contracts. And although, I mean, partly that's true to some extent, uh, even though there are some limitations in terms of the actual automation, it's certainly not this distinguishing factor of smart contracts. If you want to simply automate something, you can do that in a completely centralized way. In a, a regular database, let's say, where you have some, uh, some uh, uh, processing as in some, some business process engine behind it, and you definitely don't need a smart contract. In fact, smart contracts are way too expensive for this application. Where smart contracts are really strong and why they're so exciting is because they're transparent and because you can verify the execution and because they can run in the public domain. And that's why we look into them uh, in this class. That's the, the, the new part of smart contracts, not the automation part. Now, there are many different uh, smart contract based platforms or platforms where you can run smart contracts on. And um, I will tell you right now, forget about this list. Uh, I just wanted to show you some examples, but lists like these will age really poorly. I mean, uh, even by the time you take the exam, it will, this will be completely outdated and it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to show you that Ethereum, uh, the one we will look into in this class, so this one right here, is not the only one. There are many different smart contract uh, platforms, many different blockchains that uh, are smart contract capable, and there is no way to tell uh, which ones are going to succeed. The reason why we're still using Ethereum is actually twofold. Number one, when you look at this list, many of these other blockchains 
are using the same instruction set and the same programming languages as Ethereum. So even though it might be completely possible uh, that a different blockchain succeeds, that most of the uh, protocols and applications will run on a different blockchain in the future, uh, many of these other blockchains are actually based on Ethereum or in many cases copies of Ethereum with a different consensus protocol. And even if you have something that's not EVM, that is Ethereum virtual machine based, um, many of the arguments I will make and much of the intuition you will get from this class still applies. Uh, the alternative to just using one would be give you an introduction to all of them and then of course you would have to make it really high level and thus that doesn't make too much sense. Uh, my idea right here is to give you a background in just one of them and you'll learn a lot about this one and then you can apply it to other blockchains when needed. Moreover, and that's really important to understand as well, I mean, we didn't just pick a random one. When you look at the current state of the ecosystem with a smart contract capable blockchains, then Ethereum is by far the most popular one. It's the dominant platform in terms of market cap when you're looking at the native protocol asset, but also in terms of economic activity, in terms of developer activity, I can show you some stats about that, and in terms of the community. So pretty much anything right now is Ethereum based. There are some other blockchains, of course, which also uh, are starting to get some traction, but Ethereum is by far uh, the largest one at the time of this recording. That's from a report from Electric Capital, the developer report from uh, 2020. And uh, you can see that the number of developers, active developers they have measured here on the x-axis and in uh, Q3 uh, 2019 and here on the y-axis Q3 2020. And of course, uh, when you're above this diagonal right here, this means you have a growing developer base. And when you're below, uh, then you have a, a declining developer base and the further up to the uh, top right corner you are the more developers you have and again this basically supports what i just said um, even though there are many alternatives when you're looking at the developer distribution you're looking at the community ethereum has by far uh, most active members as of right now but once again and i just want to mention that one more time this does not mean that this will always be the case and it's not um, a lecture that is exclusively about Ethereum. I just want to give it an intuition so that you're uh, ready to develop your own protocols. And even if this may change, even if there may be something else um, that might be dominant later on, uh, Ethereum will give you a fantastic background to get started, uh, getting started with, even with a different blockchain. Now, how are we doing this? I already told you that first we will look into Ethereum, then we will look into the programming language. You will get some examples how you can develop your own protocols. Uh, and then of course, we will have an example of one of these ecosystems. And the number one ecosystem as of right now is decentralized finance. So it's all about these financial applications, all about these financial protocols, and uh, there is something uh, I have proposed a while ago. It's the decentralized finance stack. This has been published in the Federal Reserve Bank uh, of St. Louis review. And basically what I'm saying right here is you have these, this layered approach. You have the settlement layer, uh, which is essentially just the blockchain where everything runs on. Then on top of the settlement layer, you have the asset layer where you're creating some, some tokens uh, and basically a representation of value, a representation of assets on chain, on the blockchain. And on top of that, you have the protocols. So things like exchanges, lending markets, derivatives, asset management, which also are deployed on the settlement layer on the blockchain and make use of these assets. And then on top of these protocols, you have some applications and some aggregation platforms, uh, basically just some nice front ends that interact with various protocols. But what is super exciting about DeFi, and you will get a, a deeper understanding of that in the DeFi overview lecture later on, what's super exciting is that with this protocol stack right here, with this layered approach, you can create something that's completely transparent, completely open, completely interoperable, and recreates most of the financial services that are offered today in a centralized way. 
Now, I already mentioned that this will be an interdisciplinary class. And uh, that's, I mean, I cannot stress that point enough. It doesn't make too much sense to look into blockchain just from one perspective, because you will always have to uh, severely simplify things and you will not get a full understanding of what is going on. So to understand what this is about, you need at least a partial background in all of these disciplines. You will not get around looking into some cryptography. You will not get around looking into some computer science. Uh, otherwise, it's just really high level and doesn't make too much sense. On the other hand, it's also super important that you're looking into the economics, because especially when we're talking about DeFi protocols, especially when we are looking into how these protocols works in terms of the, of the, of the incentive structures behind them, uh, then you need some game theory and you need some economics, you need some finance, of course. And that's why this class really is somewhere right here in between these three fields. You, you will get some crypto basics. Uh, you may already have them from the Bitcoin blockchain and crypto assets course. That's also part of this open crypto lecture series. Of course, you need some computer science. Uh, you need to understand how the Ethereum protocol works. And then you need some economics. And that's exactly what we will do in this class. You will use different tools and, of course, uh, uh, learn a programming language. In this case, it's Solidity. There are different programming languages when it comes to smart contracts, but this is by far the dominant one as of right now uh, and, and uh, certainly really helpful to understand, to read and to write your smart contracts. Okay, So you will get the basics of Solidity in this class. In terms of the IDE, the Integrated Developer Environments, you will be using mainly Remix. It's a browser-based IDE. It's just really simple to set up and it's uh, sufficient for our examples. Uh, you can also use Atom. Uh, it's a super powerful and customizable IDE uh, that also supports Solidity syntax. So this might be something you, you want to look into if you're already more advanced. Uh, in terms of version control, you can use, of course, Git. Uh, GitHub, we recommend doing so, but it will not be a specific part of this class. I mean, it's just something you should always use when you're familiar with it. What we will look into in greater detail, though, is um, Ganache uh, in order to set up your own private blockchain for developing purposes. So uh, in the course of this class, you will set up your private blockchain on your own computer. Um, where you can develop against, where you can try out some of the protocols instead of going to mainnet or a public testnet. And then for testing purposes, we will use mainly Truffle and Metamask, where you can play around, where you can test your own protocols and where you also might get a chance to test protocols from other students. Throughout the slide deck, there are all these different boxes. It's really just to make it easier for you when, when you're revisiting the material, um, there are some sample code boxes that's particularly useful for the group projects when you're revisiting the content, when you're looking for something specific, and you usually find the code snippets in these green boxes. Then you have the key takeaways, so something that's super important. Some, some key statements on the slides are usually in the red boxes. And then you have some exor exercises in the black boxes. That's really some hands-on exercises where you should do something. There will also be problem sets at the end of each section. So after each video, uh, there will be a, a, a small, well, it's not really a problem set. It's more a quiz, uh, a multiple choice quiz where you can test whether you understood everything that has been part of the video. Now, let me give you some, some uh, brief background on uh, the blockchain classes at the University of Basel. We have been offering different blockchain courses since uh, 2017. It started with the course Bitcoin Blockchain and Crypto Asset that already uh, has been recorded as part of our uh, Open Crypto Lecture Series last semester. Uh, but there are also more applied classes, for example, a hackathon-based uh, class where students use uh, their blockchain knowledge to create some um, new protocols for usually for, for companies. And this one, this one is specifically, this class you're watching right now is specifically for smart contract development. So it's the introduction to smart contract development. And we decided um, to make this graduate, so master level class, also part of the Open Crypto Lecture Series and make it available to the public, completely free of charge. So everyone, not just people who are enrolled at the University of Basel, everyone can take this class online 
Uh, of course, you cannot receive credit for it um, because you have to be officially enrolled to do that. But if you really just want to learn about the content, if you want to look into it, if you want to take the problem sets, if you want to follow along the videos, then you can just do that on our platform completely free of charge. Now, there are various ways how you can take this class. In fact, there are three different ways you can do. Um, number one, all of the videos are available on YouTube. So there's a YouTube channel, but we just want to watch the videos. You don't need anything else. Uh, go on YouTube, look for the channel and you can watch the videos. But then there is also, excuse me, then there is also this platform, CryptoLectures.io. It's based on, on Teachable. It's a completely open platform. You can also do that free of charge. You have the videos, you have the platform. It's basically some structured content. It will save your progress. And you also have the quizzes, the end of chapter quizzes. If you're officially enrolled at the University of Basel, you have the videos, you have the platform, you have the quizzes, and you can take part into the, in the group project. Um, so you will get some feedback on your own protocol, the protocol you're developing, you're part of the seminar, and you will, uh, if you pass the class, you will receive the, the credits, the ECTS. The reason why we cannot do that for the general public is because we usually have uh, more than, well, thousands of uh, people who, who enroll through our uh, online platform. And obviously you cannot have a, a seminar with thousands of people. So that's something um, somewhat unfortunate, but that's something we can only offer to the uh, University of Basel students. Here you have the links, YouTube channel, CryptoLectures.io. And if you're considering um, enrolling at the University of Basel, you find some general information right here. Now, as you can probably imagine, this really is a massive project. I mean, you're, you're seeing the videos, the, the, the slides, the problem sets, the platform, everything. And then behind the scenes, there even is a GitHub repo uh, where we are uh, providing all of the source code for these slides, for example, again, completely free of charge to the public. And this really would not be possible without this amazing team that is working behind the scenes on this project. So I'm deeply thankful to my PhD candidates, Tobias Bitterle, Mitchell Goldberg, Matthias Nartler and Katrin Schulow. They do a fantastic job. They are also really active in the space, also research wise. So you should definitely, definitely uh, follow them on, on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, check them out. And also the student assistants who, again, also do a really fantastic job in, in supporting uh, these lectures and supporting this project with the open crypto lectures and and uh, Lorenz Gehring, Pierre Minestemir, Jonas Rukti and Daria Türkauf. And it wouldn't be possible without them. I mean, it's I'm just really thankful for this amazing team. And I cannot stress enough the fact uh, that this is a team effort and would not be possible without these people that are involved behind the scenes. One last thing, and this is something that's exclusively relevant for the University of Basel students, but it's still a really important part. And that's the question of grading. And the grades at the University of Basel will consist of uh, two uh, partial grades. So we will receive a grade for the group project. That's 40% of your final grade. Um, you will develop a smart contract based protocol, which is a smart contract, a set of smart contracts in a group. Uh, of two to four students. You have already received the information by email uh, how you can form these groups and you will receive some additional information on what exactly is expected um, for these group projects later on. It doesn't make too much sense if I tell you right now because you first have to get the introduction to everything. You first have to learn about the programming language, about the protocols. But once we're ready to actually start with the group project, you will receive some additional information on what exactly is expected. For the presentation date, see the course directory. You also have received the date, the presentation date um, by email in your welcome email. And the second part of your grade is a final exam. Uh, this of course is an individual grade, something you have to do on your own. And it's 60% of your final grade. It's a 19, uh, 90 minutes uh, final exam, closed book. Uh, so no cheat sheets or anything like that um, are allowed. And it will be a mix of true false questions, multiple choice, but also some number and text or figure boxes 
Um, so yeah, you pretty much have to prepare for anything because there can be some short answers, there can be some drawings, there can be some code snippets, but uh, the bulk will be multiple choice and true, true false questions. As always, or not always, I shouldn't say that, um, but in most of my classes, if not stated otherwise, you may use a non-programmable calculator in this class, in the exam of this class. Uh, please uh, visit the page with the rules uh, because there are some specific rules on which calculators you can use and which calculators you cannot use. Uh, it's a non-programmable that is allowed and there is a specific list with model numbers you're allowed to use for the exam. Uh, please give this page a visit and prepare for the exam also by uh, looking that you have a calculator which is compliant with our guidelines. All right, then uh, some references for the class, of course, uh, the, the report I've referenced, something you should read um, as part of the class, maybe not right now, but uh, certainly when we start talking about decentralized finance, uh, uh, is the, this paper right here, uh, then it's always a good idea to revisit the Nick Sabo papers to get a general idea of smart contracts, not necessarily in a blockchain context, but just to realize where this all started, where the initial idea for smart contracts actually came from. And that's it for the introductory part of this class. Stay curious. See you soon.